My fault. Okay. I believe we can probably start. It's noon. Alice, if you want to go ahead and. Oh, I have. Um, um, I have. We have one minute left. Oh, so. my computer. Okay. <laughs> but Linda is okay. very precise about the time. <laughs> Now I have noon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we can get started. And uh, welcome everyone to our positive, positive behavioral interventions in community settings and our family and caregiver series. We, although we say family and caregiver series, we also have uh, um, many uh, parties, pr prior and current participants who are working with children in the community setting. So we, wel we welcome you all. And this grant, uh, this training is being supported by um, the Cigna grant and also by the DHS PBS grant from the um, IBT. So this is a great collaboration between the University of Kansas Medical Center and the IBT. Uh, um, we are um, having uh, a wonderful presenter today, and th since this is a series, just want to give you all a heads up and look for all the emails that we send out and continue to attend. And also we have uh, prior um, sessions that are being recorded on the YouTube, so if you want to see what we have covered in the past, you can also access uh, the YouTube as well. So uh, for today's session, we will keep um, everyone muted while uh, the presenter is presenting. Um, but in the meantime, please feel free to chat in your questions. Our presenter will try to answer your questions throughout and at the end. And at the, uh, also at the end, if you feel you want to ask questions, you can also just feel free to unmute yourself. And if you can, we would love to see your lovely faces today. So, so if you can turn on your camera, that would, be, that would be great. But we also understand if you are in a situation you don't feel uh, appropriate to do so, we can also understand. And if you wish to receive a certification of completion of attendance, um, just make sure that you signed in with your email address and your real names. And also, if you uh, have not to sign in with your email and your names, just to make sure that you have your uh, first name and, and last name uh, on, the, on the ID that's on the Zoom. So you can always change your name by hovering over your participant video or name box and click on the three dots in the upper right hand corner and choosing rename. And I see a lot of you already have your name there, so wonderful job. Um, so, again, the webinar is will be recorded and we will send you the link afterwards. Um, and we also will really, really ask you to be uh, to be expecting a, a email with the survey as well. And we will also put that survey at the end of the session so you can answer right away if you prefer that. But um, the survey is really a very simple survey with several questions about your, um, you know, how satisfied you are with the content of the training. And then also we always welcome open-ended uh, feedback. You can write in and let us know. Um, this is really important because we really want to um, be able to provide some data back to our funder so they see that um, the money they give us, we are, pro we are creating some changes and we are, uh, you know, having some impact in the community. So if you uh, want to continue to uh, help us, please feel, uh, please help us com uh, complete those survey. Um, before, you, um, before you move off this slide, if you want a completion certificate, just drop that in the chat. You know, I would like a completion certificate and we'll track that and make sure you get one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Linda. Linda, uh, before we started introducing our presenter today, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I just think that's it. Um, um, if you have any questions, one of the things that you'll see, and um, Ashley, you may, um, um, show them the little spot that, you know, every time they see this little um, symbol in there, um, that that's an indication, go ahead and keep 
um, adding comments or questions and we'll do our best to keep up with it and or make sure our presenter, Dr. Fowler, gets those at the end, so. Great, thank you, Linda, for that information. And uh, um, today we have, we are so lucky that we have Dr. Ashley Fowler to present. And uh, she is a clinical psychologist and postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Child Health and Development at Kiyo Medical Center. And uh, she has a um, doctoral degree in clinical psychology with a really strong focus in pediatric population and has expertise in parent-child interaction therapy, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Also, she has a wonderful background in leadership and is a proud vet veteran of the United States Coast Guard, with, uh, which ultimately brought her to the field of psychology so she can help uh, families, children um, with, to build a healthy and, and, and uh, safe outlet. outlet. And also she has her master's degree in clinical psychology and also has uh, two bachelor's degree um, <laughs> as well. So um, one thing that I, I do want to emphasize is that um, Dr. Fowler is really at her last week of her land postdoctoral fellowship here. So we are really, really grateful that she's able to present here today when she has other million things to do. So um, really, we re really appreciate this opportunity to, to learn from you and have this discussion. Okay, Dr. Fowler, it's, um, I will turn to you. Thanks, Alice. <laughs> <Really> <laughs> yeah, please feel free to add in anything that I have missed and uh, yeah. No, you pretty much covered it. Um, today is basically my last day before I move cross country. So yes, it's been really, really hectic. And when you all asked me to do this, I knew that it would be a little bit um, hectic, but all, always those unforeseen issues like technical issues. So I'm actually from working from home today. Um, I do have two dogs who like to bark. So I have uh, secluded them as much as possible. So if there are any interruptions, I apologize. Um, so I just wanted to give you all that heads up really quickly. Yes. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for asking me to be here. I was kind of given a really general sort of um, idea for where to go with this. So I kind of um, will be discussing the stages of social emotional development and growth in children, but also in a literal way, but also um, in, in a more uh, I wanted to add some of my own experiences there too and give you guys that because I know that you can go online and read these things, um, but I think it's most helpful to kind of share from um, a clinical experience that, that I have had over the last six years and been fortunate enough to have. Um, so I, am, I have trouble presenting and reading the chat box. So I don't know if anyone is able to just kind of read questions for me as we go. I would love to have an interactive hour versus everybody just kind of sitting there. So I do in, encourage people to ask questions um, specifically relevant to like, what have I tried or my experiences? I think that's the most easy for me to discuss um, on the fly. So like, what have you done with this kid or what, what would you do in this situation? And there is an opportunity at the end for questions. Um, and with that also, I do have a patient at one that I don't want to be late for. So I'm going to wrap up promptly at about 12.55 and sprint across the street to KU. <laughs> so um, please bear with me. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. We will read the questions for you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So, all right. We've already covered this. Um, little agenda. So introductions wrapping up now and then the didactic presentation. I put it until about 12.45. Um, and then group discussion, I said to 12.50, just because I know inevitably it always goes a little over. So I'm going to try to skedaddle right about 12.55. So Ashley, I'm going to um, um, back, back up one more slide. This way? Yeah. So for those of you who are um, attending today, if you just write your name and the organization you're affiliated with in the chat box, that would be absolutely great. Thank you, Dr. Heitzman Powell. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> that is quite okay. All right. Um, should we pause for a second and wait for people to? No, answer? no, no. They'll just. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and then, yes, like I said, we'll have um, time for ideas. And like 
uh, it was mentioned earlier, we have level up little these little signs. So when you see it, we want to hear from you and you can add in the chat, I think would be ideal. And um, Alice can give us that information. Um, all right. So the purpose of this training is to improve um, their training from uh, integrated behavioral technologies and ensure that there's they're meeting their community needs um, based on your feedback. So there's going to be a post session survey, but not after this direct series or this specific um, presentation, but after the last session of the PBS series. Um, yes, so just um, kind of a, I guess, a disclaimer, information is presented based on evidence that is currently accepted within the profession. I did try to do some references when possible, but a lot of it is just um, off of the top of my head too, so. Um, all right, so our topic today is developmental stages for social and emotional growth. Um, I put in parentheses SE just for short, so that's quick and easy reference. So when you guys see that, you'll know that that's what that's referring to. Um, all right, so my agenda today, obviously I wanna cover the social emotional stages of development from ages birth to age eight. Obviously we could go way higher than that, keep discussing um, development, but I didn't feel that we would have enough time to adequately address all the stages and ages. And there's so much, I really had trouble just condensing in a manner that I felt would be appropriate for today. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the resource of the CDC to developmental milestones um, website and application, um, which I use personally as a clinician to make sure that I'm on track for where these kids need to be as far as their development and um, how to make sure that I am most up to date because even with a bunch of education and training and reminders, I still need to um, double check myself because there's a lot of specifications and of course, there's always research that's evolving and changing. So we want to make sure I'm I'm most up to date with what to expect. And then I wanted to talk with you all a little bit about like alexithymia and ways to identify alexithymia. My what it apologies. Is, I couldn't hear what you said. And how to best help children express their emotions. So to begin, uh, research in general shows us that there are uh, three universal facial expressions that are very distinct and are present from birth. And this is globally. So there's been several studies done to um, just kind of recognize that there, these three, anger, joy, and fear, are uh, widespread across all cultures, communities, and um, time, time frames. So the first measurable milestone that I wanted to point out is at one to two months of age, the infant or social smile in response to parents, high pitched or vocalizations or smiles. So you'll begin to see that those of you that have children or those of you that work closely with children will begin to see that early on. And that's a way to kind of check and see where they're at. Um, stages continued. So in between six to 12 months uh, of effect, effective attachment relationships established with a responsive caregiver. So that may be the parent that may be um, an adoptive parent or a foster parent, or even sometimes um, caregivers if children are in daycare or work frequently or spend time frequently with an individual. You will often see stranger anxiety begin to emerge as infants distinguish between the familiar and the unfamiliar faces. Um, so this is kind of a noticeable stage in children where they begin to be fearful of others um, at that age. And you might notice that they don't really trust other individuals, um, but that's them just feeling out new people and deciding whether or not they're comfortable with them. And that's perfectly fine. I always tell parents not to give me their babies because I just, I know that they're still unsure and they have some of that anxiety. So I like for them to warm up to me first before I just um, hold a child or I'm near a child, even when working um, with children in general, I just try to, um, at all ages, I guess, try to just be patient with them and wait for them to warm up to me. Um, developmental stages continued. Around eight months of age, expect for joint attention skills to develop. Uh, so an infant will begin to look in the same direction as the caregiver and follow their gaze. And eventually they'll learn to look back at the caregiver and uh, share that experience. So one of the things I have done a lot this year in the clinic is really um, focused a lot on learning what shared enjoyment looks like when I'm doing autism assessments. So that's been one of my new endeavors this year, I guess, that has really helped me um, 
grow as a clinician. And one of the things that we talk about is this shared enjoyment. Um, so another, I guess, caveat to all of this is that when we don't see these things, that it is time to have um, some concern or know when to be concerned. And I'll talk about that more when we get into the developmental milestones from the CDC. Um, so, um, Ashley, yes. do you know if there are like any standardized measures that if you're working in an early learning center <clears throat> or um, like there's some folks on here from the Family Guidance Center right. in Topeka, it's like, are there any sort of like we have the MCHAT as a screener for autism? Is there yeah. any kind of screener for some of these joint attention or um, stranger danger, or any of those like really early skills? Um, I am unaware of those. I was going to say the M chat. I've I've given the M chat a lot. Um, we used to. I worked at a maternal and child center in the past, and I know that we've relied heavily on the M chat for where to go, and we gave it standardized to all parents. Um, I believe it's up to eighteen months. Mm -hmm. So. Do you have any recommendations for that? Um, I don't know any for like the um, joint attention. Mm -hmm. So, but that seems like something maybe we could, That that's a really good thing that maybe we could look at yeah. <laughs> Dr. Fowler and yeah. see if we could find that maybe to share with people because I don't know of any. And it seems like if we don't know of the, any here at KUMC that, if anybody on the on the call is aware of any early screeners for like joint attention and some of those really early social behaviors, um, you know, that would be a good thing to share. So I was on the uh, research conference virtual one yesterday, and there's one presenter who shared um, a tool called Rita T. Uh, I can put the link in the chat. But basically, they are a level two, so it's a little bit more uh, advanced than MChat to screen for autism. And uh, I'm I, I'm pretty sure they also have uh, items for um, joint attention. Thank you. Sorry, Ashley, for interrupting. But. No, no, I appreciate the thought because I hadn't thought about that. I was so focused on getting literal information out there. I, I and the time frame, I was like, I don't want to go over, and so I should have considered other um, providing some free measures because free measures are awesome. <laughs> um, okay, so I am going to keep going here. Before I move on, does anyone have any questions about um, up to that? 12 month stage and full disclosure, I, I primarily work with children a little older than that between like ages four or five and, and up. So the younger stages I'm a little less familiar with, but um, I'm happy to talk about it or try to answer any questions anyone might have. Well, there was a comment in the chat that um, one of our participants son had zero stranger danger. And but in speaking to the physician, um, the physician said, well, just don't let them go up to strangers, right? So, um, you know, it may be worthwhile to, um, to think about some of, the, some of the strategies that we can use to help educate our pedi developmental pediatricians or primary care docs <clears throat> or um, things that they can do in places they can refer. I think there's a big push on right now. Um, for some of those wraparound services to be able to help families like that. So right. um, if you're I interested, we can provide you with some of those resources. I feel like that stranger danger tends to coincide often with kind of this elopement behavior where they kind of run off or run up to others. And I know that LEND recently came out with an excellent elopement document um, that has, I don't know if you're, you remember seeing that, but that it's a visual and it's really thorough and that may be helpful for how to manage elopement behaviors that that do tend to um, also include you know this stranger approaching strangers and maybe not having the best boundaries <laughs> so um but yeah we can provide some information for that after this if, if necessary um so between 12 and 18 months you would expect the infant to learn or explore their environment by support from a caregiver so supervised of course and carefully and then by 12 months of age 
Infants start requesting by pointing to objects of interest and integrate it with eye contact um, between the object and caregiver. So they'll point and they'll look at you, look at, and then look back at the object and kind of have this um, three point gaze in a way. And um, that is one of the things too that we look for when we're doing autism assessments to see if they're integrating that pointing or if they are pointing and if they're integrating their eye contact between, and I guess, um, going back and forth between looking for, at you and looking at the object to kind of communicate with you. And then this showing and sharing, this tells you that they want you involved at 18 months of age and they really are interested in what you think and what your response may be as a parent or caregiver. So we want you to um, know that that's something that we expect to see around that age is where they're bringing you toys or where they're um, showing you something that they really love or talking with you about that or is, or um, not talking with you, but presenting that to you, I guess. So any questions or experiences with this where um, you've had a child that really just loves to show and share with you or hasn't maybe, and has been less around this age? Um, see if I can see the chat. Oh, okay, so the stranger danger concern. Um, just a, maybe a brief question to Kelsey. Um, how old was your son when he was having the stranger danger concern? Um, so he was a toddler. So even as a baby, he would just go to different people, but then it raised flags because particularly one incident we were at like IHOP and like he literally went to a different table, sat there and they picked him up and took him to the front door to go get a coloring book. And I was like, panic, panic, panic. Um, so then at his next checkup, we spoke to doctor and was like, this is, I like have never seen this in a child. Usually they're a little, at least apprehensive, but he was quite happy to go with them. And so I said, you know, it's a bit of a concern. And they said, just don't let him go. And I was like, that's not my point. I'm not going to let him go. Um, clearly, um, I wanted to know what to do to work on that with him because I don't want him to be scared of people, but I wanted him to not be willing to go with strangers that easily. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, that's kind of why I was asking about the age, because there's a point where children can kind of understand, you know, who a safe person is or um, discuss that with them and people that they recognize um, and who, you know, how to identify maybe a possibly not safe person. So people that they haven't had discussions with or met before. Um, so how old is your son now, Kelsey? He's eight. Um, and my husband and I always talk about he would be the child to get kidnapped because if you were like, hey, I've got the candy in that van over there, he'd be like, oh, well, if it's a Twizzlers, I'll head out over with you. Like oh to gosh. this day, he's still really super trusting of adults um and like you know you see people at the mcdonald's or walmart's and things like that like with the food or money and things like that and he's very willing to just roll down the window hey what's going on over there and i'm like hey you know you still want to be cautious of people you don't know their story you don't know how they're going to respond and he's like yeah but they just look so sweet and i'm like ah. Okay, uh, that could be partially true, but um, let's not cool, test it. Cool. Let's just not test it. Um, I know I'm, are you familiar with the term indiscriminate affection? <laughs> or have you heard that? I know I've not heard it with affection. Um, so it's, it kind of is what makes me think about it. But um, one of my favorite interventions to do with children that have kind of this, um, this is a little tangential, but I'll get back on track, um, is it's called no go tell. And it's, it's like a script card. Um, it's, they're rather expensive, but we, I've had them in my prior clinics and you present, it's a poster size card. And I think it's about 300 different scenarios or something, or maybe 70, 75 different scenarios. And you present it the, to the child and it's like, oh, this person approaches you in a car, what do you do? And the, the go-to phrase that it's easy for children to remember is called no, go, tell. So you say no, like I'm not going, I'm not doing that. And then you go, like you run away from the situation and then you tell, right? So you tell an adult or a stranger or a, not a stranger, sorry, but an adult or a trusted individual. Um, so the no-go tell cards are a great resource for that. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, it's one of my favorites because there's so many different scenarios um, that you can't predict as parents or caregivers because you're not always with your children. So um, just a little tangential thought there. So I don't know if anyone's I ever appreciate. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right. Thank you for the participation. I appreciate that. Um, so this emotional part kicks in, I would say around 15 months of age, 
where empathy and self-conscious emotions emerge. So sometimes you'll see a toddler be, you know, I had a story yesterday of a patient that said um, one of their very young children, I think he was three or so, got off of the bus or at daycare and he saw another child hurting and he went over and like gave him a hug and was just so sweet because the child was crying and um, the other kid was crying. So it was just, it's neat to see this empathy develop in children and how they become self-conscious of their own emotions. Um, so they'll react typically by looking upset when they see someone upset or someone cry or feel pride when they're um, positively engaged or applauded for doing a task. So um, one of the best things I can tell caregivers to do is to always give positive labeled praises, right? So um, I've had some parent-child interaction therapy training where one of our biggest focuses is this positive approach where we want children to do that behavior over and over again. So the good behaviors that we do see in them, we constantly are like, oh, great job for putting that, putting your shoes away, or thank you so much for um, clearing off your plate, or I love how you're playing really nicely with your sister. So things that you really want them to do, we call it praising the positive opposite. So things that you notice them doing a lot of, you can continue to help them do that by giving them lots of um, positive praise and feedback. So moving forward between that 18 and 30 months of age, uh, the individuation or autonomy emerges. So where children start to feel their own identity and they start to really um, have some preferences, right? So that's when you would expect to see that. And then around 18 to 24 months of age, they learn to pretend play, such as talking on a toy phone or feeding a doll um, or playing next to another child or with another child. So these are also things that we look for in the autism clinic. And that's where my brain is right now. So that's why I keep um, deviating to that, I guess. But um, that's one of the things that we try to prompt them to do is to pretend to talk on the phone or pretend that we have a little baby doll in, the, in our assessment kit where we can kind of prompt and pretend to see them feeding this doll. And if that's not happening, it's kind of a red flag for us as clinicians because we're like, why isn't that happening? This is age appropriate play and behavior and um, emotional development because they should have some sort of kind of connection with, with um, the pretend play. So, uh, between 30 and 54 months, you'll see impulse control, gender roles, and peer relationships or peer relationship issues emerge. So a little like toddler fights or um, disagreements between kids can happen. Um, a caregiver plays a major role in helping them define their values and learn kind of flexible self-control. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get into my alexithymia piece about how we as caregivers can best emulate positive emotions for um, social emotional development and positive relationships. Um, by three years of age, your child uh, should engage in more interactive play. So masters their aggression and learns cooperation and sharing skills. So they can typically play with one to two peers and they learn how to take turns and have joint goals. So maybe they're building a tower together and they're working towards that or maybe um, they're playing a game and they, they're taking turns back and forth. So it's, it is interesting and important to kind of keep track of that. Is, the, is my child or this child that I'm responsible for able to allow another child to go or able to allow me as the caregiver to interact too and take turns? And again, that's something that we make note of in our clinics here is, is the child that we're assessing currently able to allow the parent to take turns? Are they flexible with that? Do they understand that perspective taking of the other person where you know, the other person may want to have a turn to and engage in that play. Um, let's see. It's also pretty imperative that they have at least one or two peers. So I know COVID has been such a weird year and I've had a lot of parents ask like, what do I do? My child hasn't had any socialization for a year and a half and that's tough. So I know that that's been a little bit of an unusual sort of year and a situation with this global pandemic this year, but, um, generally not within a pandemic children should be frequently associating with other peers and allow have that opportunity really to allow for that development of the social skills so um, and then at about five to six years of age the child can follow simple rules and directions so they should have this kind of receptive language down where they're able to really you know if you say hey please make your bed right now they should be able to know what that means or go brush your teeth or whatever 
the direction is and be able to do that. Um, another thing we talk about a lot in parent-child interaction therapy is giving really um, direct commands and directions so that children can understand clearly. So um, making them simple, like uh, singular. So asking children at this age to do one thing at a time instead of multiple things like, hey, please go um, put your shoes away, clean up your room, put your dishes away, and then come back here and you know, sit with me. So that's a lot of things. Like I would probably forget those things as an adult. <laughs> so at this age, you really just want to be simple and clear with them as much as possible and make sure that um, the directions are not ambiguous. Like cleaning your room is kind of an ambiguous direction. Um, so that's easier for them to understand. Um, this, oops, this kind of goes into the giving praise piece that I mentioned. Um, so it's always good to model giving praise. I always tell parents or caregivers um, in my PCIT cases where I say to um, model giving praise to each other too, because that's also how children learn to give praise and to be appreciative of others. So, you know, I'll say practice giving labeled praises between mom and dad every night too, because that's important for all relationships. Um, and it models good, um, I guess, social emotional development for children. And then you may notice that children at this age begin to want to spend more time with peers and groups as, um, and relate to their group of friends. So they might have, um, we always prompt our kids to find things in common. So what, what do you have in common with another person and how can that unite you in a friendship? So that's a great way to start and um, encourage children to start if they're having difficulty making friends. Um, any questions here before I keep going? Oh, thanks for the no-go tell, Dr. Heitzman Powell. That's awesome. It's my favorite. Oh. <laughs> I'm a little biased with some of my interventions. I just love that one. I think it's amazing. I've recommended it to like friends, parent friends of mine too, who've got it because they just want to do safety training for kids. Um, okay, if there's no other questions, I'll keep going. Checking my time. Okay, I think we're good. Um, and then, so at seven and eight years of age, the child begins to fully understand rules and regulations. So this is where you can say, you know, fully set kind of house rules. Like if you don't do this, then this is gonna be the consequence or um, earning, right? So in order to help them understand that they need to earn their privileges, like they can understand that really well at this age. And that's where they, um, you can use that as a caregiver to kind of, I guess, incentivize them to um, follow rules and learn social normative behavior or socially acceptable behaviors, you know, like screaming in public or having a fit is not typically a socially acceptable behavior. So we wanna help them understand that. Um, showing a deeper understanding of relationships and responsibility and taking charge of uh, simple chores. So I always say, um, if parents can provide their children with some type of, um, I guess, simple responsibility or daily task that really helps them develop this responsibility and helps them communicate with you too about um, you know, what they can do and uh, speaks to, I always say too, parents who are able to give their children tasks can really tell them that they're capable of doing more and that they believe with it, in them. And then it also provides this wonderful opportunity to give them labeled phrases. So when children have more specific and clear opportunities to develop or to complete tasks, that would result in a positive praise. That's a great way for them to um, have their pride and their, uh, I guess their ego boosted and feel confident in themselves, which in itself is a whole other component where we really want them to um, feel prideful so that they can be functional humans and adults someday. <laughs> uh, and then moral development further. So you'll see too with children around this age that they're able to kind of understand right and wrong and you can present them with certain situations. Well, hey, what do you think you should do in this situation? You just hit your sister. So would it be nice to go apologize? Or do you think, you know, I don't know, just trying to work with them on that and process that. So at this age, they're really able to understand that, you know, hitting my sister was wrong. Um, there's alternative solutions and they have the communication typically at this age to um, have alternatives. So any questions before I go into um, the milestones and trackers for the CDC? The only other thing that I would say about that, giving children chores and whatnot, it also teaches them the beginning of goal-oriented behavior, yes. right? I have this goal, here are the things I need to do in order to reach that goal. 
So it helps with that delayed gratification as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. It really does. And I, I have a lot of parents come into me and ask, they've asked that question, when is it appropriate to give them chores or give them responsibilities? And I say, I do say this age is when I generally refer to as long as it's developmentally appropriate, right? Because each child is specific and may have specific or different needs. But generally, this is a great time to do that. And I always try to get parents to look at the long picture, like, or the, the overall point of this, like you, they're not always going to have you and they're going to be adults someday. So we want functional adults, highly functional adults who are able to have these responsibilities and chores. Um, I look back on my own like chores and responsibilities as a child and oh my gosh, my parents were just nuts, but I'm grateful because they, they taught me the meaning of delayed gratification, right? So that was, that was a big, <laughs> a steep learning curve, mom and dad. <laughs> All right, so how can we track this easily? So this is new to me. Um, I didn't know this existed until this year, but I love it. Um, I personally don't have my own children. However, I downloaded this app and I created a fake child <laughs> so that I could go back and track their development and move forward to track their development. So now I have like a 13 year old in my phone that just exists and I go through and I will, reference that whenever I see a kid. So I'll flip through their um, develop. It won't let you just look at a general development. You have to add your a child, which is strange. So anyway, I created this kid. And whenever I go in to see children, um, I will reference this milestone to see, you know, if they're 18 months or if they're, um, you know, four or five years old, I'll go in and I'll check to see where they're at and if their development is appropriate. And that kind of helps me and serves as a guide for me for how to um, know what questions to ask and keeps me on track for what to um, guess ask and questions what what questions to ask. Okay, so hopefully you have the app. I encourage all of you to download it and create fake children. I or if you have your own children, it's awesome to put your own children in here. It also has um, like for caregivers, it's great. And for parents, it also has a little spot where you can notate their um, doctor's appointments um, when they have upcoming um, milestones. And then this was the app that I meant to um, tell you guys that it'll also tell you when to become concerned. So say you have a four-year-old child and they're not doing this. Well, when do you bring it to a professional? When do you get that referral? Or when do you just talk to your PCP about this? And that is also in this app, which has been immensely helpful and or the website. So there's also a website if you don't want it on your phone, which is great. All right, I'm checking the chat. Okay, oh yeah, thanks Dr. Sang, yes, multiple children. Okay, so I wanted to take a minute um, to kind of discuss one of my passions or one of my um, big pushes as a clinician that I talk about often with parents um, is a term called alexithymia. And um, I, the four years I was in grad school, I worked closely um, on dissertation and collecting dissertation data with another, my friend, another girl who did this actually as her whole dissertation um, and researched um, alexithymia in um, urban children in a criminogenic environment. So we were really interested in this collectively and I talk a little bit about it in my own dissertation, but um, alexithymia is a subclinical sort of phenomenon involving a lack of emotional awareness or more specifically difficulty, difficulty identifying and describing these feelings and distinguishing these feelings from bodily sensations of emotional arousal. So essentially in, in more condensed terms, it's really like the lack of verbalization and ability to express yourself um, emotionally. So I, I might make a note in my notes, like struggles with alexithymia, like has difficulty identifying emotions. And I felt like this was just really relevant to social emotional development in children. So I wanted to take a minute to talk about this today. Um, but before I move on, I'm curious if any of you have heard of this. So if you had, I would love to know in the chat, if you've ever heard of alexithymia or that term has been kicked around with you at all. I think it's a great term to summarize a really big concern. Um, not I, not I. Oh my gosh, exciting. All right, my supervisors have it. So that makes me feel really excited because I, I feel like I never get to actually teach anyone anything. Um, okay, cool. Yay, yay. 
Ooh, okay. Psychiatry staff talked about it. That's awesome. I love that it is when it's used and being in environments when it's used. I also worked in an inpatient environment in Florida last year in Miami where it was used um, quite a bit. So I was excited to hear that. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right, thanks everyone for participating. I love the participation. Okay, so what does this look like? Um, so I saw this a lot. I worked in a Title I school for four years where um, children had been quote unquote deemed unsuccessful even with an IEP. So I had a lot of kids with a variety of disruptive behaviors, autism um, develop, and other developmental disorders, intellectual disabilities. So lots of things um, that I was exposed to for these four years working with these kids. Um, but it may look like a lack of verbal communication when they're upset. So disruptive behaviors. So I've seen cheer throwing, I've seen punching walls, I've seen throwing yourself down on the floor crying and screaming. I've seen um, yelling, I've seen, you know, just um, almost like Tourette's, but not Tourette's, but just like screaming a litany of foul language and just that inability to say, I am upset right now. And it doesn't even necessarily just apply or is singularly for negative emotions, it's for all emotions. Um, I've also seen this isolation or quietness or non-responsiveness where children just shut down because they know that they're feeling something, they know they're frustrated or upset and they have this unmet need. So I want to help them, like how can we get your needs met? But I can't do any of that without you telling me what you're feeling or thinking. So I really like to help children express that. Um, and then kind of the verbal aggression, which I already kind of addressed, but saying I hate you or things that aren't relevant to what they're feeling. Like I hate you has nothing to do with really like what they're feeling. They're feeling angry or they're feeling hurt. Or they're feeling offended or left out. And that comes out in different ways or like you suck or whatever. I've had kids say all sorts of things to me, go away. But it's not really telling them, telling you what they're actually feeling or allowing them to know what they're feeling. So how can we as caregivers address this? I tell every single parent I have model all emotions. So all emotions are acceptable emotions. So if you're feeling angry, if you're feeling sad, um, it's important for us as adults and caregivers to model that from day one. So, oh, I'm really upset right now because my car won't start and it's frustrating or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm hurt that you didn't, um, that you hit your sister or I'm, I'm uh, disappointed that you were not able to complete chores. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about the kid, of course. It can be, because um, you're with your children all day, especially those of you who are parents, and they see you modeling these emotions. Um, that also teaches children that all emotions are acceptable, right? So um, we as adults have anger, we have frustration, we yell, we can be sad, and we're entitled to those. But sometimes children are not always entitled to those, which is hard because they should be. So I want to encourage you all to remember that too. A child is a, is a person before they're a child, if that makes sense. A child is a human before they're a child. Um, so they're gonna have the same emotions that we have, um, but maybe they don't have a proper outlet for it. Um, so I think as caregivers, we can really just kind of tell children when we're feeling a certain way and they will just naturally begin to pair that with your facial expressions and your own emotions. Um, and then also discussing the child's own frustration and pointing out to them when they are sad. So saying, you know, I see that you're feeling frustrated because you cannot open that lid. Would you like for me to help you? And then again, this gives a great opportunity to give them some labeled positive praise. So they say, yes, can you please help? Or yes, and they, or they just hold it out to you or whatever, expressing to you that yes, I need some help. And then you say, good job asking for help. Is there anything else you're feeling right now? So maybe, you know, maybe there's an underlying um, emotion or need that isn't being met that's coming out as this frustration with not being able to put the toy together. Maybe um, I've had kids that I've worked with in the past who have like just been furiously scribbling and I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then, you know, the furious scribbles is actually like, oh my, my dad just went back to jail or these big things that kids are dealing with that maybe you're their only outlet to discuss with. So just giving them that opportunity, like I see you're frustrated. What are you feeling right now? And then how do we do that with kids that struggle? So I have a visual chart. This is just a brief example for you, um, but I pulled this and I know we're almost out of time. Um, let's see. So my little chart example, um, Etsy is a great um, reference or a great resource, I guess, for um, like printed laminated fun charts about emotions and feelings. 
I've ordered tons of them. I have them all in my offices whenever I, um, it's not COVID, I guess. And I put them on my walls and um, I've even done like a smiley face wall or an emoji wall where I allow kids to come in and I'll give them like this whole like bag basically or box of like emoji stickers and I let them go through and they pick the emoji and then they get to put it on my wall when they come in. And it's really fun for kids to be able to um, use these kids love emojis too, if y'all didn't know already, but they get really, they're really into it. So that allows them to kind of help express what they're feeling and be able to, um, I guess, tangibly do something with that. So this is my chart example that I have. Um, there's also a website called um, We Teach, or it's a teacher's website where teachers create stuff and then sell it for their classrooms. Um, I've found a lot of great visuals in there too. I'm, I hope someone knows what I'm talking about and can add it to the chat because I can't remember what it's called. Um, Teachers pay teachers, yes. Oh my gosh, that y'all, oh, that is my favorite website for aside from maybe Etsy too, but for um, finding these visuals for kids that are already printed, made, ready to go. You don't have to do anything. And um, a lot of the time they're great for writing on too with like um, uh, markers or dry erase markers. Okay, so, so um, quickly before you move on, the other thing on that chart yes, is um, um, if, everybody remembers when Dr. Fowler first started, there's three basic emotions. And um, unfortunately, a lot of times people stop after teaching those three basic emotions. But if you look here, this one has like seven different things. It's a gradient, right? And there's different emotions in between. So I would encourage everybody to um, stretch beyond the three basic emotions and continue to teach and model um, the gradients that are in between. Awesome, thank you. Yes, that is such a good point. And if you if you do a deep dive into these charts too, there's even more. There's like 20 different emotions and stuff. And um, the older my kids get, the more emotions I present them with because they're able to developmentally understand and express themselves better in that way. So I'll give them a hundred emotions sometimes. Like, what are you feeling here? Like, what's going on? And that can be kind of fun too and helpful for them. Um, so problems like why is lexithymia important? Why do children be able to express themselves? Well, one, it leads to poor social competence. So this inability to socialize with friends, peers, and of course that transitions into adulthood. And we want to build really functional, um, healthy, well-rounded little children so that we come up to be big adult humans with good social emotional functioning. It impacts personal relate or relationships, so both personal and academic and professional. So I know we're talking about children here, but I think that that's relevant. So as these children go on to get jobs, we want them to be able to have this these feeling words where they can say, "Hey, it really frustrated me when you showed up late or when you you know weren't able to do this correctly." Um, it is more common in children with autism. So I did put that note there again, just because it's on my radar. It's what I've been doing all year, which is great but um, something to keep in mind. And again, when children do have autism, it's even more important to model that. So I know, I'm sure a lot of you work with children um, with different developmental disorders. So just know that it's even more important to express your feelings and emotions. And I'll even say, you know, get down on their level. So you're eye face to face with them and say, look at my face. My face is mad right now. And then make your mad face or look at my face. My face is really happy or sad or whatever. So that helps children pair that with that emotion or that expression. And then it just helps in sustain positive relationships. So sustaining being that the big word. Okay, try to be quick. Uh, wanted to give everyone an opportunity to, to talk today or to respond. Um, key takeaways um, or what you'll apply in your practice or what would you share with a parent or colleague? Feel free to chat in about your main takeaway, or you can just unmute yourself and we can have a short discussion before we let Dr. Fowler run back to her clinic room. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, I, I felt like um, it's really, really interesting to hear that new term I have not heard about, but and also I'm really glad that you pointed out how it is important to recognize it, it did ex it exists co-occur with some symptoms of autism, but 
autism definitely has more symptoms than just that. Yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, alexithymia. There are some assessments for alexithymia. Um, the ones that I found was normed in Toronto, I think, in Canada. Um, but I can definitely find some others. Um, and there, it's kind of a newer topic. So a lot of the research is within the last three years, which I think is even better, really, because it's so relevant. But um, yeah, there, there is a measure. I found it earlier. Um, but I was like, oh, this is not normed in the United States, so I probably shouldn't share it. Um, but I will, yes, I'll follow up and I can definitely confirm that. So, um, but yes, I would encourage anyone out there to share that term and to use it, especially in professional settings. Um, obviously not with kids, it's probably not developmentally appropriate for them, but, you know, just helping them to understand their emotions and express that because, and to remember too, that children are entitled to their emotions. I say that all the time because we as adults forget sometimes that, you know, we always have these emotions and then we don't always make room for them with children. Um, and I'm, I'm big on allowing kids to just have, feel angry or feel sad and not shame or fault them for it and just to make room for it and process it with them. Um, Cause you might learn something about them and that in itself helps develop a healthy social emotional understanding and awareness. Yeah, I think, you know, with the new DSM, um, well, it's not new anymore, but the DSM-5 um, um, process for diagnosing autism now, where it's a spectrum, and whereas before you could not have any co-occurring conditions, and now you can, so we can have kids with autism with comorbid ADHD. Perhaps we can have kids with autism, and they have comorbid uh alexithymia yeah thanks <laughs> so that's my takeaway i'm going to say that alexa alexithymia 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 i'm going to yes. say it you know repeat it i have the two the tuperative a little sticky note on my computer because that's a, another term that i learned which means bitter or abusive Ooh. like oh that's a really the tuperative that's a really good good word <laughs> it obfuscates the meaning right so anyway um so i'm gonna try to use that term and look up um um assessments for that to see yeah. if it's a co-occurring condition or you know if it's if it's one of those conditions that when you have those kids that are like on the cusp you can't quite tell if they're hitting the cutoff for autism or not, maybe this is one of the social behaviors that they're having trouble with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's definitely not a, like a, like a diagnosable condition. I probably should have made that clear earlier for those of you that aren't familiar with the DSM. Um, but it, it's just a term. So uh -huh. just want to make that clear. So people aren't looking for it in the DSM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it could be something that, because you called it subclinical, right? So it's a subclinical condition. So there's like not a, a clinical diagnosis for this condition, but you know, it's like, what are some of the ways that we can help kids who struggle with their social and emotional responses um, and development to be able to become well-rounded and you know, be able to participate. So I like that. And then I also think the other thing that I'm going to take away is um, I'm going to look for, <clears throat> um, maybe ask some of my colleagues at Juniper Gardens Children's Project, if they have any standardized measures for early childhood. Um, I know they're working on the IGDs over there, if anybody's heard of the IGDs. And I think one of the ones they're working on, um, they're called IGDs. And it's, I'll put that in the chat too. Awesome. It's individual growth and development indicators for infants. Okay, awesome. And so I'm putting that chat in there. It's a really great tool for some of the stuff you were talking about, Dr. Fowler, yes, where it, um, um, there are little five minute play-based measures that are standardized that gives you a growth chart, like when you go into the doctor and you get head, circumference, weight, and height, it gives you where you stand on the growth chart. It does the same thing for um, communication. 
and they're working on the social emotional development for infants. Oh and goodness. so um, it's designed for kids six to 42 months. I dropped that link in the chat and um, that may be one of the route. It's a play-based measure, right? So it's one of the things that's designed for progress monitoring and um, you know, making sure that your children are like developing and acquiring skills is um, anticipated, so. Awesome. Thanks for all the resources and the information. And uh, we would love to continue this conversation and probably answer more questions, but we want to make sure that Dr. Fowler got to her clinic room safely. So I think we're going to end this uh, training a little bit earlier today. And thank you all for coming and thank Dr. Fowler for presenting today. And uh, we will send out a, a follow-up um, email with the, a short survey and we would appreciate, appreciate it in advance if you can complete it. And also we will continue to have this series. So expect some emails from us to let you, to let you know our next session. And we would love to see you back again. Thank you so much and have a great day. Yeah, and before you jump off, if you'd like a certificate of attendance, please drop your name in the chat box, or if you'd like any of the other measures that we're going to pull together, also drop your name in the chat box. We'll be able to pull that after the session ends and be able to get some information out to you guys. Yeah, and uh, thank you. Oh, uh, I cannot copy and paste things, but there's a link in there that's the survey. So if you want to just complete right now, you can do that. We, you can also expect an email. Thank you. Thank Kyle, you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was so fun. Have a good week. Best Bye. luck. Thank you. Ashley, have a good Bye. rest of your week. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Have a good session. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be. Bye. Thank you.